Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. This installment, we'll be delving into the contemporary British literary masterpiece, Atonement. When it comes to the author of this book, Ian McEwan, he is undoubtedly a revered figure in British literature. Not only does he have an impressively prolific output with bestsellers galore, but he also garners endless praise from the literary critics. In the 2007 Booker Prize shortlist, one of his books sold more copies than the combined sales of all the other shortlisted works. Atonement consists of approximately 130,000 words and is structured into three parts with an epilogue. Unlike the familiar novels we know, these three parts not only divide the story chronologically but also employ different narrative perspectives and writing styles, taking turns to tell the tale. The first part of the novel employs a traditional omniscient viewpoint, exuding the atmosphere of classic British literature, exquisite, elegant, intricate, and meticulously portraying nuanced character relationships. As the narrative unfolds, we step into a country estate in the south of England in 1935. At the brink of World War II, there's an air of tension, but the entire estate strives to maintain an orderly facade. The first character introduced is Bryony, the second daughter of the estate, a precocious and fervent young writer who has just completed her debut work, a play entwining cholera and love, depicting a wealthy young lady eloping with an outsider. After finishing her script, Bryony enthusiastically directs her cousin Lola and her twin brothers in performing the play. From an observer's perspective, it seems like the sibling's other task is to highlight the apparent happiness of Bryony's family because their parents are on the verge of divorce, and the future is uncertain, leading them to temporarily stay at the estate. It's worth noting that, for Bryony, the love of order appears to surpass her love for writing, as she believes, a chaotic world could be tamed through writing and her preference for order gave birth to principles of justice. In her view, death is the province of moral decay, and marriage is the reward for the virtuous, something that must come to fruition by the last page. Next, we encounter the mistress of the estate, Bryony's mother. From her, we gradually discover that the peace the estate supposedly possesses is merely superficial. To maintain this so-called happiness, she must suppress herself turning a blind eye to her husband's infidelity and enduring the drudgery of household chores and numb silence. We also see the arrival of the eldest son, who brings with him an esteemed guest, Paul Marshall, a chocolate magnate who has prospered through the war. Marshall's character is quite intriguing because, in this way, it seems that the aristocracy, living off inherited wealth, and the nouveau riche, who have gained wealth through commerce, have found a perfect convergence within the estate. Marshall's visit may carry a hint of matchmaking. From various details, we might speculate that his target is the beautiful Miss Cecilia. However, Cecilia is not impressed by Marshall's nouveau riche demeanor. Her heart has been captivated by another man, Robbie, the son of the estate's caretaker. Cecilia and Robbie are of similar age and share common interests, seemingly ideal protagonists in a classical story. In Bryony's eyes, if she were to cast her sister and Robbie as abstract, romantic figures in a play, she might be able to accept it. However, she gradually realizes that life is not as straightforward as a play. For instance, she notices a tension brewing between Cecilia and Robbie. Nevertheless, we soon learn through Cecilia's perspective that the emotions of these young lovers are teetering on the brink of eruption, a tug of war between reason and emotion. On the surface, Robbie and his father are fortunate, as the estate's master generously funds Robbie's education, affording him the opportunity to study at Cambridge alongside Cecilia. However, the class divide runs deep, and beneath the surface of life at the estate, various details reveal the immense pressure Robbie faces, preventing him from openly acknowledging Cecilia's feelings. In a state of restless turmoil, Robbie writes a letter for Cecilia, to be delivered by Bryony. However, it's only after Bryony departs that Robbie awakens to the fact that the letter he had intended to discard was the one sealed in the envelope. Not only does it contain a passionate declaration, but it also includes explicit sexual insinuations. Meanwhile, the appropriate letter for Cecilia, suitable for her to read, remains at his typewriter. Cecilia soon receives this letter, but she also discovers that Bryony had secretly opened and read it. 
In fact, Bryony not only read it but, with her limited understanding, sensed a certain danger in its coarse language. She felt that some complete human thing, or male thing, threatened the order of her household. Nevertheless, Cecilia doesn't have the luxury to reprimand her sister, as the fervent words in the letter stir her emotions. At this point, the narrative perspective in the novel begins to switch back and forth between Cecilia and Bryony. In the estate's library, Bryony suddenly witnesses Cecilia and Robbie in an intimate embrace, engaging in acts entirely beyond her comprehension. This scene profoundly shocks her, as she perceives it as an attack on her sister. Subsequently, almost like a film replaying, the novel revisits this episode from Cecilia and Robbie's point of view. It's worth noting that explicit sexual descriptions in literature are a challenging and controversial aspect for any writer. Each year, the British literary world holds the so-called Bad Sex in Fiction Award precisely because of the contentious nature of this issue. In Atonement, this sexual description not only plays a crucial role in advancing the plot but is also executed with precision and elegance, vividly portraying the passion of this couple, which bursts forth like fireworks after extreme suppression, in an exceptionally moving manner. However, the young girl Bryony couldn't comprehend what she had witnessed. The animosity accumulating within her would have fatal consequences in the subsequent events. It's noteworthy that, structurally speaking, the events that unfolded in the library became a focal point, dramatically altering the fates of all the characters thereafter. This McEwen moment is a recurring theme in many of his works, becoming a signature characteristic. That evening, under the cover of a moonless and windy night, Bryony's cousin Lola falls victim to rape, sending the entire estate into chaos as they seek to identify the perpetrator. Recalling everything that had transpired earlier, Bryony decisively points her finger at Robbie, labeling him as the sex maniac she imagines him to be. Under her persuasion, Lola hesitantly implicates Robbie. Bryony takes her dramatic talents further, claiming to be an eyewitness, embellishing the story with vivid details. She even rummages through her sister's room to retrieve the passionate love letter, which she presents as evidence to the police. The novel uses a calm narrative tone to describe how Bryony gradually makes her lie seem true, starting from subtle suggestions and escalating to outrageous claims. Eventually, she reaches a point where, even to herself, she becomes increasingly convinced that she actually witnessed Robbie committing a heinous crime. In Bryony's self-created dramatic scenario, she becomes the shining embodiment of justice, and the silent residents of the estate unwittingly become her accomplices because, in this aristocratic world, Robbie, the son of the caretaker, is the lowest-ranking individual, and pushing him forward as a scapegoat is the most reasonable choice. The only one who believes in Robbie's innocence is Cecilia. Robbie is arrested and imprisoned, while Cecilia boldly severs ties with her family, marking the end of the first part. When the second part of the novel unfolds, the setting shifts to Dunkirk, five years later. Dunkirk in 1940 was a pivotal moment in World War II. At that time, the British and French forces had been defeated by the rapid advance of the German army. The British Expeditionary Force was forced to evacuate from Dunkirk in the northeast of France, conducting one of the largest military retreats in history. Historically, this was a gripping event. The British successfully evacuated their main forces, preserving their strength for future offensives. However, during the retreat, countless nameless individuals were reduced to statistics, their suffering and pain only conceivable through fiction. Robbie is among the troops waiting for evacuation, and the narrative in the second part closely follows Robbie's perspective. Through the narration, we gradually learn that enlisting in the army was the only way for Robbie to escape imprisonment. So, he follows the troops step by step to Dunkirk. What he witnesses is the chilling spectacle on the eve of the evacuation, with corpses strewn around, and in his hand, he clutches a map he has just retrieved from one of the deceased. In the film adaptation of Atonement, the suffocating atmosphere of the battlefield is vividly depicted in a single, continuous five-minute shot. This shot has become a classic in film history, and its literary foundation is the exceptionally composed narrative in the second part of the novel. Compared to the relatively intricate, leisurely, and refined pace of the first part, the second part presents an entirely different aspect. 
As Ian McEwen once said, there's no place for clauses on a battlefield, so in the second part, we encounter a multitude of Hemingway-esque short and powerful sentences. Through Robbie's eyes, we witness the harsh conditions of survival in Dunkirk, surrounded by constant bombings and danger. Through Robbie's thoughts, we feel his longing for Cecilia. Starting from his imprisonment to his enlistment, Cecilia braved all odds to visit him, bid him farewell, and never ceased to correspond with him. In one of her letters, Cecilia unveils the hidden truth from the first part, they hurt you, all of them. They ruined your life, and in doing so, they ruined mine. They would rather believe the hysterical testimony of a silly, lying little girl. They encourage her, give her no room to back down. Amidst the ruins, while waiting for rescue, Robbie suddenly recalls events from the estate. In the summer of 1932, the ten-year-old Bryony deliberately jumped into the pond in front of Robbie, forcing him to save her. Do you know why I wanted you to save me? The girl said, because I love you. From this detail, we can infer how the girl's budding emotions later transformed into bitter jealousy under intense circumstances. Throughout the entirety of Atonement, it is only here that the dark cloud buried deep within Bryony's heart becomes discernible. Towards the end of the second part, the survival conditions in Dunkirk worsen further. Robbie, with his fellow soldiers, embarks on an arduous journey, but fatigue and illness flood over them. He falls into a high fever. In a semi-conscious state, he hears the news that the ship coming to rescue them is about to depart. All he needs is a little more sleep, and when he wakes up, he will be one step closer to his homeland and his beloved. He feels an unprecedented calm in his heart, with Cecilia's promise. I'll be waiting for you, echoing in his ears. Before him, he envisions her in her green dress, outlining her slender figure and her shoulders wider than mist. Filled with hope, the second part comes to an abrupt end. Immediately following, the novel swiftly transitions to the third part. This time, it's still 1940, but the setting is London, and the narrative perspective closely follows Bryony, who has now turned 18. After five years of reflection, Bryony realizes that her past lie has wrought a great wrong, destroying her sister Cecilia and Robbie's happiness. Regretful and remorseful, Bryony embarks on her journey of atonement. She works as a nurse in a hospital, hoping to find Robbie among the wounded soldiers. She attempts to contact her sister while diligently pursuing her writing as a pastime, submitting her work for publication. Although her literary efforts face repeated rejections, her writing significantly fills the void in Bryony's spirit. Through this, she deeply believes that a profound transformation is taking place in the depths of human nature. Things were indeed moving in a positive direction. After some twists and turns, Bryony found the house her sister had rented, and her sincere confession seemed to dissipate some of the tension between the sisters. Suddenly, Robbie, just returned from Dunkirk, emerged from one of the bedrooms, and Bryony was both surprised and delighted. Although Robbie was about to leave for the front lines, the lovers had a brief reunion, and Bryony finally granted herself a moment of peace for her conscience. She believed that the war would pass, her appeal to the court would eventually succeed, and Robbie would ultimately clear his name. She was also confident that she could complete her own atonement. What comforted her greatly was the fact that neither war nor herself, Bryony, could destroy the love between her sister and Robbie. However, astute readers will find an unusual epilogue at the end of the third part, signed with Bryony's name and dated 1999. The epilogue of Atonement takes place in 1999, on Bryony's 77th birthday. Narrated in the first person by Bryony herself, she informs us that she has been diagnosed with vascular dementia and will gradually lose her memory. In a few years, she won't even recognize her old friends. Before sinking completely into the abyss of memory loss, Bryony has time to reminisce about the past, and readers follow her recollections, finally unraveling all the mysteries. It turns out that the one who raped Lola was actually the chocolate magnate Paul Marshall. After the incident, the victim married her assailant, and since then, they have led a life of comfort and luxury, without any signs of remorse or conscience. This marriage not only preserved the family's honor and financial interests, but also prevented Robbie from clearing his name. 
However, Robbie didn't need to clear his name because Bryony tells us on the final page that there was never a reunion during the war, let alone reconciliation afterward. Robbie died of sepsis in 1940, on the eve of the Dunkirk evacuation, and Cecilia died in the same year, in the September bombing of Balham Station. Both of these events are actual historical events from World War II. In that fateful year, they never met, and they never met Bryony. Bryony had the opportunity to visit her sister in June but hesitated, stopping short in front of Robbie's grave. She simply didn't have the courage to face her heartbroken sister. This brutal twist ending delivers a profound shock to all readers who believed in the concept of retribution. Reading this, we realize that the complete and moving tale of atonement we just experienced is only partially true. Much of the details presented in the second and third parts are products of Bryony's imagination, and the epilogue at the end of the third part reveals this to be a vivid work of fiction authored by Bryony and published in 1999. As the real tragedy fades away, what endures perpetually is the novel, the fictional work by the renowned writer Bryony. The ending of this novel was continually rewritten to become what it is now. Why did Bryony write it this way? Her own reason is, so I will write the final draft that has everyone alive and in love, and leave this godforsaken place to the godless Marcel. She also says, how can a novelist achieve atonement when, with her absolute power of deciding outcomes, she is also God? There is no one, no entity or higher form that she can appeal to, or be reconciled with, or that can forgive her. There is nothing outside her. In her imagination, she has set the limits and the terms. No atonement for God, or novelists, even if they are atheists. It was always an impossible task, and that was precisely the point. The attempt was all. After reading Atonement, readers often find it difficult to disentangle themselves from complex emotions. For the entire story, the ending is both a continuation and a reversal, forcing us to adjust all the conclusions we drew during the reading process and reconsider a fundamental question. What kind of novel is Atonement? Firstly, in terms of its literary lineage, Atonement stands as Ian McEwan's pinnacle work following a period of exploration and transformation. In 1974, at the age of 26, McEwan arrived in London. In this highly stratified society, he, from a modest background and educated in ordinary schools, felt like a country mouse, constantly asking himself, How can I change this situation? How can I become a lion? I have to roar. So, he released a series of strange and challenging short stories that pushed the boundaries of what readers were willing to accept, adopting the persona of Ian the Terrible, and roared his way into the London literary scene. At that time, McEwan's stories, both in terms of subject matter and technique, were sharp and experimental, often associated with words like the dark side of human nature, ethical taboos, and sensitive subjects. As various cultural movements waned in the 1980s, McEwan seemed to tire of this style of writing. After several years of creative block with almost no work published, the post-hiatus McEwan adjusted his direction. Though his thinking remained incisive, he began to tone down his roaring and adopted a more composed narrative style. His view of the world became more moderate and insightful, shifting from the sharpness of focusing on issues to the complexity of those issues. McEwan continued to be highly productive. Atonement, published in 2001, was the most outstanding of all his works, whether assessed by literary experts or the market's response. In various recent selections of the most outstanding English novels worldwide, it frequently stands shoulder to shoulder with many famous classical works, earning its place among contemporary classics. Next, in terms of character portrayal, Atonement is a novel about the dimensions of human nature. Regardless of the size of their roles, Ian McEwan peels back the layers of the characters' personalities with a classical patience, gradually guiding readers to see the truth. Especially in the first part, the subtle class conflicts within the mansion, relationships that appear harmonious on the surface but are, in fact, deeply complex, are slowly revealed through precise and understated narration. The process of Robbie being unjustly pushed into prison is written tightly and cohesively. From the beginning, the novel shapes Bryony's dramatic personality, laying the groundwork for how family order seeps into Bryony's sense of drama, 
influencing her subconscious, and setting up convincing foreshadowing for her later false accusation of Robbie. When the mansion begins to identify the culprit, McEwen doesn't rush to judge the bystander's attitude but subtly points out, through Bryony's hysterical performance, that their silence speaks louder than words. They share the same inescapable responsibility for Robbie and Cecilia's tragedy. Additionally, through the supplementary narratives in the second part, the third part, and the epilogue, readers delve deeper into their reflections on the entire event. Whether it's the gradual dissolution of the British manor economy facing modern urbanization before and after World War II or the catastrophic consequences of childhood sexual misalignment, these elements naturally blend into the texture of the whole story, enriching this not-so-long novel with a wealth of information. Furthermore, from a writing technique perspective, Atonement is a novel about the essence of storytelling. In this novel, we follow different characters' perspectives and see their narrative versions of the same events in different times and spaces. The boundaries between good and evil, reality and fiction, truth and illusion are blurred through the various narratives. Bryony's fiction interferes with reality, directly leading to Cecilia and Robbie's tragedy. Later, her attempt to achieve atonement within the realm of fiction is filled with strong irony. According to Bryony, it was always an impossible task. England is a nation historically known for its understatement, a term that essentially means speaking in a roundabout way. This polite and gentlemanly habit sometimes serves as an excuse to dilute the true meaning and evade real responsibility. Therefore, some critics argue that the reflections on the essence of storytelling in atonement can be expanded from a narrow sense to a broader sense. For example, the appeasement policy that Neville Chamberlain pursued with Hitler before World War II, where he almost agreed to all of Hitler's demands to avoid war, could also be seen as a target of satire in this novel. It's reasonable to believe that Ian McEwan, often referred to as the National Novelist of England, offers a serious reflection on the narrative syndrome that permeates the national psyche through this novel. Whether for individuals or groups, narratives are both incredibly true and incredibly false, enchanting and cruel, capable of giving life and taking it away. Finally, Atonement is also a novel about the history of literature. As we mentioned earlier, Atonement matches different narrative perspectives with different writing styles. The omniscient perspective in the first part carries a classical elegance reminiscent of Jane Austen. Robbie's perspective in the second part bears a striking resemblance to Hemingway. And Bryony's perspective in the third part focuses on psychological analysis. Furthermore, through Bryony's narration, the novel reveals the truth, which is influenced by the style of Virginia Woolf, a famous British stream of consciousness writer. When reviewing Atonement, American writer John Updike aptly said, Wolf's candle glimmers throughout Austen's tale. It's important to note that Ian McEwan's skillful control of writing styles serves the novel's overall theme and structure rather than being mere showmanship. Why do we say this? Here, we need to introduce a concept from postmodern literature, that is, metafiction. Metafiction is fiction about fiction, focusing on the fictional identity of the novel and its creation process. Traditional novels often concern themselves with characters and events, i.e., the content the work narrates. Metafiction, on the other hand, places its emphasis on how the author constructs the novel. Such novels often, at some point, declare in some way that what is presented to the reader is the author's fictional creation. The narrative of the novel often discusses the ongoing narrative itself, making this narrative about narrative part of the whole novel. Such a narrative is called metanarrative and novels with elements of metanarrative are often called metafiction. Without a doubt, in Atonement, Bryony's final confession in the ending is a typical structural method of metafiction. Summarizing Atonement solely as metafiction is, of course, incomplete, but once we understand this concept, we can better appreciate Ian McEwan's thoughtful use of different writing styles throughout the novel. While reading this roller coaster story, we are also guided by the author to review the history of the novel's development, observe the diversity of literary narrative styles, and deepen our thoughts on narrative itself, all amplified through Bryony's final meta narration. In other words, the subversion in the ending brings together the previously different writing styles into a coherent whole, forming a complex and diverse epic novel that fuses the history of narrative art. Well, that's it for this interpretation. 
Let's recap the key points of knowledge one more time. 1. Ian McEwan is the national novelist of England, known for his prolific output, best-selling novels, and high praise from literary critics. Atonement is his representative work. 2. Structurally, the passionate scene in the library becomes a focal point, a turning point where the characters' fates dramatically change. This McEwan moment is a hallmark of many of his works. 3. The ending of Atonement is both a continuation and a reversal of the entire story, forcing us to adjust all the conclusions we drew during the reading process and reconsider what kind of novel Atonement truly is. It's a novel about the dimensions of human nature, the essence of storytelling, and the history of literature. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.